Now I'm going to preach tonight a very strange topic and I am coming out of Judges chapter 7 if you stand look at verse 5 so he brought down the people verse 5 so he brought down the people unto the water and the Lord said unto Gideon everyone that lappeth with the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth him shall thou set by himself likewise everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink and the number of them that lap put it in his hand to his mouth were 300 men but all the rest of people bowed down upon their knees to drink the Lord said unto Gideon these 300 men thy lapith will save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand and let the other people as this word said go home I want to talk about give me the dog lappers Give me the dog lappers. In our text tonight, we're dealing with a young man named Gideon, who's probably unknown by many of you in the Bible, but I am sure that you can recall watching the movies, The 300. I recall many years ago when it came out, I went to see this movie about The 300. The 300 mighty men that were able to defeat a whole army. And in our text, you'll see where Hollywood got that idea about the 300. You will see why this means so much to us tonight. God told Gideon, who was a farmer, a young man out doing the normal things that farmers would usually do, he called him. And said to him, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor, I want you to go and deliver my people from the hands of the Midianites. I was approximately over 130,000 or maybe more than 170,000 people. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands more than Israel had, whatever the number might be. Now Gideon was a little upset when God sent an angel to give him this task to set his people free from the Midianites. He was a little upset with God and the angel. And when the angel called him, Gideon said, you give me some signs because I'm disturbed why God allowed his people to be in the hands of these Midianites. We don't understand why God has forsaken us. We looked to him and we saw how he led Moses and the children of Israel through their crisis. We look at our past, how God delivered us out of the hands of Egypt, and we see how he led us by a pillar of cloud, by day and night. We see how God fed them in the wilderness. We look back and see how God called those uh, us, the people of his eye, and yet, why is God forsaken us, and we're now in the hands of these Midianites, these ungodly people, and why is he allowing all this to happen to us when he said we are his people? And the response came back, Gideon, that God has never left his people. You left God. And sometimes that is why we suffer. That is probably why we are going through things in this country. And we get mad at God. Well, if it's a God, why would he let COVID kill over a million people in America alone? Women and children and babies just in America. If it's a God, why would he let something happen to my child, who just a baby that died, if it's a God. Why would God not cure all the people of all the diseases and dying? If it's a God, 
Why doesn't he just put an end to the enemy and just hear our prayers? If it's a God, why would he allow a storm to come and tear down the homes and wipe away innocent people? And I'm sure God responds back, I didn't do this. You did it. You have left me. You put me at the bottom of the totem pole. You always come to me when you're in trouble. But you don't seem to appreciate me when I'm getting you out of trouble. What's going on? I'm trying to make an application of how we treat God. And sometimes God has to let things happen to let us know you're not in charge. He, he does these things to put us back on our knees because when God bless us, we forget him. Shame on you. Now I can watch online and won't get up and come to church. Shame on you. God did not bring us out for nothing. But here's the problem. God has not left us. We left God. We don't talk about God. We don't want him in our lives. And is it possible that God is trying to show you, I didn't leave you. You left me. You're doing good now. You're driving nice cars now. You got a little more money now in your pocket. But I remember when your change was strange and your money was funny and your dollar wouldn't holler. But God now has made a way you can wear some rags you used to couldn't wear. Are you listening to me? God is always saying to the world right now, I haven't left you. You left me. And as a result, your enemies got you. And as a end of result, when I pull away, the devil will get you. When I back away, demons will get you. You need to be bringing your children to church while they're young. You need to be talking about God is good while you're blessing him. You need to be lifting him up while you still got health and strength. You need to be praising God's name while you got breath in your body. And that's what God told Gideon. Don't be mad at me about your enemies getting a hold of you. I didn't leave you. You start worshiping Baal. You brought idols in. And you start worshiping these gods that got eyes and can't see. Turning on me and I can see all you do. You, you, you took your eyes off and went to listen to God that got ears and can't hear. Turning yourself against me and I hear all you see and hear all you say. You, you left your me and God worshiping a God that got legs and can't walk. And you left me when I'm quicker than quick and sooner than sooner. I can hear you while I'm praying and ask you at the same time. That's what God said to him. You left me out. <laughs> And Gideon, I tell you what, I'm going to give you some signs. I don't have time to go through all the signs God given because he wanted a sign that God was going to be with him. He said, I'm going to be with you. And I am going to deliver your people, the Israelites, out of the hands of the Midianites, which now you have to bow down to them and they control you. My God, what a disgraceful thing. Let me tell you something. Here's what God told him. I tell you what, Gideon, I want you to take all your people. And he's talking about how many, the majority of those Midianites, and these demons, these enemies you got. I want you to take all your 32,000 and go down to the river. And let's give them a, a test, a military test. And uh, let's test them out and see what you got. So Gideon said, well, I got 32,000 men, God. And, but that, what is that against all these Midianites? That's a small number. God said, well, that, that's still, just take them down to the river. And let's give them a little testing, water test. So they, he got them. He took all 32,000. And God said, now let's give them a test by how they're going to drink the water. 
Now, those that, number one, God said, I want you to see how many cowards you got. And take all 32,000 down there and then ask them, say, all of you all that are afraid to fight, go home. 22,000 left <laughs> and went back home. Why did God tell him to do that? He found out a lot of folk are with you, but not with you. You can't win this battle when you got cowards. So test them by just asking them, if you're scared, go home. I need to grab somebody today. Just look at somebody you can't tell them. Say, if you're not with God, go home. Point at somebody. If you can't say amen this tonight, just go home. If you can't stand me praising God and it bother you, go home. Now, why did God tell him to go home? You'd be surprised to know when you got too many folk that mean no good and for the feel it can rub off on you. Some folk will never fight a battle because they're listening to too many folk scared. And God was saying, I want you to let them go home. Don't stay around here because that's what you call a cold bucket committee. In other words, you can be on fire this morning and somebody said she just putting on, that's a cold bucket committee. And there are a lot of folk in the church are not here because they love the presence of God. They're getting mad at you because God can use you. And all they doing all their life is talking about you, putting out rumors about you, trying to turn folk against you. That ain't nothing but a cold bucket committee. Have you ever been trying to go somewhere and somebody tell you, you can't do that? Have you ever said or had a dream and I believe God's going to do this for me and somebody, you can't do that? And you get that negative response. I got all those responses and I often talk about when I was trying to build a church. Everybody told me you can't do that. The banks weren't living no, giving churches no money then. And they told it's impossible. The bank even looked me in the face. You can't build no church three times the size of one you got. Where are you going to get the money from? I said, God. But they dispirited me so bad, they held me back five years and I wouldn't do nothing. And the property set over here nearly 10 years. The future home of Mount Carmel. One man called me and said, hey, Rep, the grass has grown up over the sign. <laughs> I said, that's all right. I'll send somebody credit. <laughs> the future home of Mount Carmel. And when we got ready to go down there, they wouldn't give me a permit to build. The neighborhood came out against me saying, we don't want no church over here. Mr. V's was over here. Traffic was heavy over here and there's just not enough uh, uh, road for that church to come over here with that many people and the only way I won I took all my members and took them down to city hall with 300 members packed out the place and looked them in the eye all the councilmen and I hit them with this how can you say it? you don't want a church over here and got nine nightclubs and say you care about the kids in the community and that's where I beat them the council voted in favor. Build your church. Let me tell you something. That was a cold bucket committee. Amen. I think I told you the story about a church who wanted to prosper and build a new church. And they wanted to tear down over because of a falling down, had holes in the wall. And, uh, and one old deacon, setting his ways, was standing up by old pole. And he said, we're going to go. He said, I ain't going nowhere. I've been leaning on this pole 50 years. And one mother got up and made a motion. I vote we give him the pole and we move on. <laughs> what, what are you going to do when all people try to destroy your dream? What do you do when your daddy tell you you ain't going to be nothing? And some people in your family say, you're not going to be nothing. The rest of them didn't do nothing. That's, a pour, that's pouring cold water on you. And God needs to let you say in your mind, go home. 
And God is saying, let them go home afraid. You know, fear is destructive. Something that appears to be real. But it's just false illusion that appears to be real. False illusion appears to be fear. And it's amazing that the Bible says fear not 365 times. So it's a fear not for every day. The devil operates on fear. The devil puts in your mind that you can't do it. The devil will tell you all the time he puts the panic in you and make you scared because once Peter became afraid of the water he was walking on, he went down. Now, Moses, uh, he made the water divide. I've seen great miracles with, uh, in the Bible, like Elijah could call down fire from heaven. I've seen Nehemiah could build the walls up, back up. But Noah, he, he saved the family from a flood, but none of them walked on water. Moses didn't walk on no water. Noah didn't walk on no water. None of them walked on the water. Think about it. Peter is the only man in the Bible ever walked on water. The Bible says he stepped out and walked on the water. Now I'm sure when they were talking on that boat about walking, the disciples wouldn't nobody get out but Peter. And I'm sure they were sitting there saying, Peter said, Lord, if it be thy lip, bid me come in the water. And I'm sure now, I'm sure Andrew said, as I calculate. He was always the one calculating. When he said that Jesus is 5,000, what is that to so many? Calculating. And he said, well, as I figured up, uh, the density of the body is greater than the density of water. So when he gets on the water, he's going down. Calculating. And I'm sure Thomas down. and Thomas said, ain't no way. Jose. Doubting Thomas. And I'm sure Judah said, I'll walk out if you pay me. <laughs> he loved money. But Peter walked. But when he saw the wind bolsterous, 14 chapter St. Matthew, then he lost fear set in. And he went down in the water. I like to say, in reaching distance. We'll right. oh, get that later. Yeah. He didn't go down in the water a long ways off from Jesus. Or uh, how could Jesus catch him? He was right in front of Jesus and went down in the water. And some of you drowning in reaching distance. Because of the spirit of what? You can buy that house. If you can pay for an apartment, you can buy a house. If you can take care of one child, you can take care of two. If you can take care of two, you can take care of three. If you can take care of three, you can take care of four. My mama raised all eight of us. But you operate what? In the spirit of fear. And God said, I can't use folk who frighten. Send them home. Now the next thing happened, and I want you to see this. When God got rid of that crowd, he said, now take the others left and go down to the river. Not just tell them if you want to go, go home. Take them down to the river. And I want you to test them by a water test. Now, I want those who get down at the river and they lap the water in their hands and on their knees while they lap and not looking up, send them home. They water lovers. <laughs> he said, send them home. Well, get it. But God, if I, I send them home, what am I gonna have left? God said, that's too many. You had too many from the beginning. Now those who lap the water, but Looking down at the water, looking probably at themselves, saying, how great thou art. <laughs> you know, a lot of folks look in the mirror and say, oh, say how great thou art. That your test. What that mean? 
Watch this. God said I need to downsize. Sometimes God can't work a miracle because there's too many folk in your life. Sometimes God can't bring you out because you're listening to too many people. And sometimes you got to learn how to limit yourself from some people that think they're your friend. Sometimes you got to pull away from some of your own kidding folk that putting you down. Sometimes you got to pull away from some church folk. If somebody can't stand you shouting right now, tell them move there's enough empty pews in here. Then let me alone because sometimes they will kill your spirit and God sometimes will allow things to happen so you will downsize. You may have too much that God can't use. You may have too many degrees that God can't use you. You may have too much money that God can't use you. And sometimes God will downsize on you. Oh, God, God. You all know how downsizing is. You know why people downsize? They downsize because they got people sitting around paying and ain't worth it. <laughs> so the company starts saying, well, they're not doing nothing, standing around gossiping. And gossiping, run them off on the job all day. And they said, well, let's just get rid of folk that's meaning no good to the company. Downsize. And keep the one that's worth keeping. Because what they're doing is hindering the others from work. God said, downsize. You got too much. Take that house. You got too much. Downsize. You got too much learning. Take that from you. Go crazy with a master degree. Downsize. You, you can't say amen no more. You're living too good. Take it away. Downsize. God said there are too many and I got to downsize, boy. Now, why was God downsizing to 300? How did he downsize? All the folk that meant no good, already scared, the other downsizing, they down, they looking, but they ain't looking up. And God said, now, I want you, when you take the rest of them down, see how the ones that's going to lap like a dog, but looking up. They lapping. The others just lapping. A lot of you all ain't into nothing but lapping. It's all right. You're laughing, but you're looking still at the water. You have not learned like the 300. They're laughing, but they're bringing the water up. Look, and God said, Hear me then. One, lap dippers. Give me the lap dippers. And give me the lap dippers, and I'll win this war. What he's saying about the lap dippers. The lap dippers are the people who are lapping but on God. Oh God, you all ain't ready for this kind of sermon. I see. You can't be a child of God when you don't take your eyes off your enemies. The reason why the devil is defeating a lot of you all, you're lapping but you got your head down. God want to bless you and give you water refreshment, but he don't want you looking at the blessing. You got to look at the blesser. But as you look at the blesser, you better look around and see your enemy. God said, give me the lap dippers. In other words, give me the people who are watching out. I want to ask you a question tonight. Are you watching the enemy? Are you watching the devil? Do you have your eyes on who's behind what's messing with you? That's not your husband. That's not your wife. That's not your children. They love you, but that's the devil working through. And the devil is working through some people that you really look up to, and you get mad at them when you need to be suing who's behind it. You need to know that it's the devil behind what's bothering you. 
It's the devil behind worrying you. If the devil want to make you give up and quit working in your church. If the devil want to run you away from your blessing. If the devil don't want you getting blessed. If the devil don't want this church to prosper. If the devil. And you know why I keep my eyes on my ministry and come over here every day and go to work? I'm lapping. But I'm looking. And when I see that enemy, the only way you're going to know the devil after you, you got to know the devil. Who that start that big argument and fight in the house? Not you and your wife. The devil. What made you say to her some things you don't know and say and don't mean? It's the devil. The devil will make members say things they don't really mean. And that's why you can forgive them. That's why I can forgive a lot of things that I say to my wife and she say to me. Can't be still married 52 years for nothing. Look, sometimes when I see the devil behind it, I plead the blood. Look over and keep going. Sometimes you got to see who's trying to break up what you got going. That you work too hard to get. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. That devil come out the sinks too. You, you, you not immune from enemy attack. Just because you speak in tongue and praise the Lord and go to church and shout all day long, that mean the, the devil won't get after you. Joel was a man after God that loved God with all his heart. He prayed for his children. He prayed for his family. Joel paid his tithe. And the devil and God got the devil on Joe. Y'all missed that. Wow. The devil and God teamed up on Joe. Did you know it? God and devil put a bet on Joe. The devil said, I bet you you'll curse you. God said, I bet you won't. The devil said, I bet you will. God said, I bet you won't. God said, I bet you will. The devil said, I bet you won't. God said, I bet you won't. God said, the devil said, I bet you will. I bet you, I bet you, I bet you, I bet you. And God said, all right, you want to put a bet on me and this man? Test him. Just go on, tack everything you got. And the devil said, I bet you he'll stop worshiping. Why? I bet you he'll curse you. When the devil went at you, God didn't stop him. That's why I say put a bet on him. Can God say, I bet you you won't on you? When the devil said, can you bet on him? God said, oh, Lord, no. I lose the bet. <laughs> God said, I already see they'll jump up and get out of our auxiliary. When somebody, let's say something about them. They already get out the choir when they don't like something. They already get off the usher board. Oh, Lord. Is the devil right about you? And the devil said, all the reason why Joe love you, you blessed him. But take that you got, give it him, and I'll make him curse you in your face. And I want you to know how Joe's wife couldn't hang with his suffering, not because she didn't love him, but the devil borrowed her mouth. And guess what he said? What he brought up, what she brought up to told God, curse God and die. The same thing the devil said, I'll make him curse you. Why did she bring up the word curse? Because sometimes your blessing depends on your mouth. Not fight God. Not turn your back on God. Curse him. That was the test. Are you watching? If she had been watching the enemy, she forgot. She had forgot the vow that to me when they got married, I take thee, Joe, to be my wedded husband from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor. She forgot all that when she lost that money. <laughs> oh, I think I'm getting somebody quiet. Are you a dog lapper? God said, give me the dog lapper. I'm watching the enemy. 
I praise God for everything, but don't let the devil take it away because God will downsize. God needs some people who will be watchful. And then I want to tell you in closing, he cut it down to 300 men. Going to go up against over 100,000. 300 is what's left. God said the dog lappers. Because the dog lappers are trusting me. The dog lappers are depending on me. It's called the faithful few. Let me close with this message. God does not need big numbers to work miracles. Sometimes it's the faithful few God depends on. You got to know the difference in counting numbers and making numbers count. A lot of churches boast about large membership, but they don't have large participation. They just got members, but not real members. Can you handle a blessing? And what happens so many times, we think that God had to give us a whole lot of things to bless us. But you got to learn how to live on the faithful few. You got to learn how to live on what's left. Not what you lost, it's what you got left. When I lost my son, you know what God told me, said? It's not what you lost, but it's what you got left. I didn't take all of them, you got two more left. And sometimes it's not what you lost, it's what you got left. Sometimes you get all upset over what you lost, but what you got left. You still got a good mind. You still got your health and strength. You still know God is still in control. And it's always what you got left, not what you have lost. I want to tell you here tonight, and closing out this night, God can get strength in weakness. God sometimes had to separate the men from the boys. God can use little things, the few things. Just 300 is going to win the battle. Why? Because God always been able to handle just a few. God can handle a few all through the Bible. It was just a few in numbers when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went up against a fiery furnace. And it was God's little faithful few. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around in the fire but not consumed. Have you ever been in the fire but not brought it up? Because God will get in there with you. It's not about a whole lot of folk all around you. It's about the faithful few. God can use a little bit and work miracles in your life. I'm talking about a God who can take a faithful few. David went up before Goliath about almost 12 feet tall. And God, uh, when they went out before Goliath, Saul said, if you can fight this giant, a little old shepherd boy, let me put your armor on. And he put on a warrior's clothes and took off David's little shepherd clothes. And David said, this stuff I can't fight in. He said, Saul, I don't need your armor. Just give me my little old <laughs> shepherd clothes. Why did David say that? Because he said, some stuff on me don't fit. And when you put your stuff on me, it doesn't fit. When you put on all this stuff, it doesn't fit. When you put all your trust in you, it doesn't fit. You need to go back to your praying ground. That fits. When you put on what the world got for you, doesn't fit. When you walk in here and can't speak to one another in the same church, it doesn't fit. When you don't want to pay no money in the church, it doesn't fit. When you go home and don't pray, it doesn't fit. David said, your clothes doesn't fit. Give me my clothes. You're talking about a faithful few. David went down in the valley and picked up 
five smooth rocks. I think they were smooth because sometimes God got to let water run over a rock and trim off some stuff in your life and get you smooth with a nice smile. <laughs> and then when he picked up these five rocks, now Josephus, that authoritative historian, said David didn't pick up five rocks for nothing. Goliath had four other sons. And he knew when he hit the old man with one rock, the boys will come out. So he had a rock for them too. But God was letting David know, I don't need a majority. I don't need a big crowd to do nothing for me. All you got to do is go out in my name. And he went out before the giant and said, you come in the name of a sword and come in the name of a spear. But I come in the name of God Jehovah. And it was a faithful few. One little old rock hit that giant and knocked him down. God can work with a little bit. You don't think God can work with a few? Jesus was in the wilderness. And the people got hungry. And they said, you got 5,000 people out here hungry, but... Jesus said they need not depart. Don't send them home. Tell me what you got. We said we got a little boy. Got five barley loaves. And two little fishes. Jesus said that's enough. A faithful few. He took what that little boy hunch was. And fed 5,000. Besides women and children. God can handle just a little bit. How many of you know God can make it with a little bit on you? Just a handful. He specialized in just a little bit. I think God would tell him, don't you know, Gideon, it was only two men that went up against Pharaoh, Moses and his brother, Aaron, and let the children of Israel out of Egypt, got down to the Red Sea, all that water in front but just a small little army and two men just a faithful few and opened up the Red Sea and made Route 66 God can take a little bit and work a miracle in your life God can take a sermon and turn you around God can take a soul and turn your life around God can take your little money and multiply it and work miracles in your life. God, wow. What, what else you want to say here, Fleming? God want to show you, watch, watch this. God wanted Gideon to know it's not about numbers. It's about my strength in your weakness. Have you discovered in your life how you made it this far with the small paycheck you got? God took your little check, your little weak check, and got you through the start of life. God want to let you know it's not how strong the enemy is, but it's how weak are you willing to be and let him work through you. See, the reason why Gideon could win with 300 men, God want to let him know you can't get the glory. That once you come through, I don't want you going around talking about what I did. Once you come out of this situation, I want you to say, this is what I did. You're going to have to say, God did it. I want you to point at somebody this night and tell them, whatever I got, God did it. If I'm healthy, God did it. If I got a breakthrough, God did it. The doctor didn't do it. God did it. Through many dangers, tall as this, I've already come. Grace, God did it. I want you to go right now. I know y'all ain't supposed to move, but go out and just touch somebody on the shoulder. God did it for me. I 
was too weak to do it. I didn't have enough money to get what I have. I wasn't health enough to be here tonight. I'm healed because God healed me. I'm blessed because God blessed me. I'm too weak. Whatever I am, God wants somebody to yield whatever you have and give him the glory. And as when Gideon went up in front of all those soldiers and only had 300 men. Oh, I want to close tonight. Yeah. Lord, I know the Lord did it for me. And whatever you have, you need to give God the glory. Yeah. Look at God. Can you look at somebody tonight and say, Look at God? Look at God. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. I am what I am because God is on my side. Yes, Lord. Mm-hmm. Well, the Bible said Gideon took his 300 men and God said, I want you, Gideon. You are outnumbered, but you're not outpowered. You may have a lot against you, outnumbered. But not out power. When Elijah was on Mount Carmel, he was outnumbered, but not out powered. So God said, I want you to take some pictures. And uh, I want you to get some empty pictures and put a light in the pictures. And I want you to take your trumpets and go down to the Midianites. And when you get down there, but you're only 300 men. Yeah, Lord. And when the Midianites, Gideon began to slip in the camp. And over here, the soldiers talking. One soldier said, we're not going to win this battle against the Israelites. I've seen it in a vision that God is going to give them the victory. When Gideon heard that, He went back and told his 300 men, the Lord told me he's on my side. And when God is on your side, everything, 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 everything is going to be all right. Yes, yes, Lord. He got his 300 men and came over in the middle of the night and God told him, all I want you to do, Gideon, the battle is mine and not yours. I want you to blow your trumpets and when you blow your trumpet, I want you to break your pictures and uh, when you break the picture, light's gonna come out. And when the Midianites see the light, and hear all that noise, they begin to panic and they start killing off one another, destroying one another. And God gave the Midianites the victory with only 300 men. 
I'm closing here now. I see something when uh, they broke the pictures and scared the enemies. I want you tonight to realize that every time God busts you, every time God breaks you, you ought to let your light shine. Every time you cry, let the light shine. Every time you have to bear your burden and keep on going, break the picture with prayer and let your light shine. And when you let your light shine, somebody going to see your good works and glorify the Lord. Blow your trumpet and let the world know I am a child of the King. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Now, now, when I see in closing here the picture of the dog lepers that when God created a miracle, I can also see Jesus, he had to get broken. Praise God Almighty. He said, hang me on the cross. And while they were leading Jesus up God gilded hill, they were breaking him. They hung him on a cross. And while he was hanging on the cross, he said, Father, Father, why hath thou forsaken me? They were breaking him. They nailed him in the hand. They nailed him in the feet. How? Oh, they nailed him. And while hanging there, he was lifting up his eyes, saying to the Father, Break me, Lord. Break me, Lord. But as you break me, I'm going to let my light shine. Pissed him in the side. Pissed him in the feet. Broke his body. And that was my deliverance. When God breaks you, he's about to give you a breakthrough. When God breaks you, he's about to take you higher. When God breaks you, he's in the business of molding your life. When God breaks you down, he want to humble you so he can use you. Everybody ought to say, use me, Lord, through my trials. Use me, Lord. I done got a little happy here. I didn't mean to get a happy tonight, but I, 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 I feel all right. I've been tired today, but I told the devil, pulling out my driveway, I rebuke you. I'm going through tonight, and when I got here, I felt my power. Sometime, you got to let God break you. Got to let him break you to get what you got in life. But when they took Jesus, hung him on the cross, broke his body, and he dropped his head in the locks of his shoulder and said, it's finished. Died. Demons rejoice. The devil had a party and somebody walked out and said, he's dead now. Go on, rejoice. It's all over. But Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Jesus left them hell, preached to the spirits in prison, put the devil on the run, and came riding out Sunday morning when they thought he was dead, opened up the tomb and came walking out, saying, All power is in my hand. God got your enemies in his hand. God got your debt in his hand. God got your sickness in his hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he make a way? Does anybody else know tonight God is on your side? Hold it here a minute. Somebody here don't know that God is going to bring you out. I want somebody to stand up tonight and spin around about three times and tell somebody he turned it around. He turned it all around. That's what he did. I didn't have but a little bit. Hey, he turned
turned it around. Oh, he turned things around. I didn't do it, but hey, hey, oh, yeah. Won't he, won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he, won't he? Oh, yeah. Won't he, won't he, won't he? Turn the things around. So I have, I got to preach to my own members now. <laughs> have you ever been in a situation you didn't know what was going to be the results? I want you to raise your hand and wave it. Now, I want you to do me one more favor. I want you to look down at the ground and say, devil, you can't touch this. Oh, you can't touch me. Oh, you, 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 you. Oh. Oh, 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 won't he, won't he, won't he, won't he bring you out? Won't he show you he's in charge? Won't God let you know he's by your side? Hey, yeah. Have somebody holler. God did it. 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 He turned it around. God did it. He healed my body. God did it. I had a breakthrough. God did it. I got my health. God did it. I got food on my table. God did it. God did it. The doctor said I wouldn't be here, but God healed me. God healed me. Come on, children. Let's shout. Come on, children. Let's shout. God healed me. God delivered me. God brought me. Brought me out. to one of my old songs that said do you know the man I said do you know the man I said do you know the man from Galilee he woke me up this morning and started me on my way do you know the man from Galilee come on go back oh do you know the man do you know the man? Do you know the man from Galilee? He woke me up this morning and he started me on my way. Oh, do you know the man from Galilee? If you don't know him, let me tell you. The man is a mighty good doctor. The man is a mighty good doctor. The man is a mighty good doctor from Galilee. What did he do? He woke me up this morning and he started me on my way. Oh, do you know the man from Galilee? Oh, the man is a mighty good friend. Man is a mighty good friend. Jesus is a mighty good friend from Galilee. He woke me up this morning, did he? And he started me on my way. Oh, do you know the man from Galilee? Something else I want to tell you. The man will be bread when you're hungry. Man will be bread when you're hungry. Man will be bread when you're hungry from Galilee. What did he do? Woke me up this morning. Started me on my way. Oh, do you know the man from and I used to hear the old folks say, Yes, I know the man. Yes, I know the man. Yes, I know the man from Galilee. Oh, yes, I 
an older man for me. Oh, yeah. Well, soon as my feet strike Zion, lay down my heavy burden, put on my rope and glory. I'm going home and tell my story. I've been coming over hills and mountain, up to the crystal fountain. All the God's sons and daughters will be drinking that hill and water. I'm going to move up a little higher, beat my loved and mother. Move up a little higher, beat my love and father. When I get to heaven, when I get to heaven, when I get to heaven, I'm going by the pearly gates. Swing on the pearly gate, walk the streets of gold, eat at the welcome table. When I get to heaven, the gates are all right. Pearly gates are all right. Streets of gold are all right. But I want to see my Jesus. I want to see my Jesus. I want to see my Jesus. When I get to heaven, going down around the altar, get out on my knees and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I thank him this morning. I thank him this evening. Anybody here want to thank him? Come on, children. Let's thank him. Come on, children. Let's shout for joy. Come on, children. Let's shout for joy. The Lord been good. Been good. Been good. Been good. He made a way out of no way. He picked me up and turned around. I want to thank him. I want to thank him. I want to thank him. Thank him. Thank him, thank him, thank him tonight, thank him tonight, thank him tonight, oh, thank him. Put him in death, sleeping in the grave, the Lord took me, my enemy behave. I'm just letting you praise it. Somebody got something to praise him for. See, I didn't, I didn't have to have a lot. God works strength through my weakness. Somebody here made it over some stuff. Look at somebody. I've been through some stuff. Point at him. I've been through some stuff. And I know who brought me out. It's down home singing here right now. That's what I brought from the country. We didn't have no music. We just got out on the floor with the dancing. Now you sit on oh, my mama. I said, God been good, baby. <laughs> I raised all my children and got them all grown. They had something to shout about. My God, my God. I'm going to bring this to a close. I'm pastor now. I got to preach Sunday. <laughs> I'm going to quit right now. Man, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Give God a hand clap of praise. <laughs>